Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. And today I'm talking to Clement of Algo Expert fame. And we're gonna have a discussion about the biggest ways that people mess up the preparation for their tech interview. So a lot of ink has been spilled about what you should or shouldn't do while you're doing the interview, but not as much, I think, on how you should effectively prepare. So whether you're a week out from your FANG interview or a month out, what are the biggest mistakes that Clement and I have observed people make in terms of preparation? So Clement, thanks for being here. How, how is it going? Very good. Happy to be here and spill the beans on the biggest mistakes for interview prep. Yeah, so why don't you get us started, actually? What do you think is the top mistake that people make in terms of preparing for their big tech interview? Yes, so the biggest mistake by far and away, and I see it less and less these days, but when I do see it, it's just so like saddening because it's so easily avoidable, is not using Algo Expert to prepare for your interviews and not using the promo code CLAM, CLAM for a discount on the platform. Just kidding, just kidding, not really, but just kidding, that's not the real biggest mistake. No, one really big mistake that I see is people who completely disregard a certain category, like for example, a certain data structure in their interview prep because they know that it's supposedly their best category. Ultimately, every category, including the ones that you're super good at, might have some difficult or tricky questions. And so the worst thing that can happen is you disregard a category that you claim you are good at, and then on the interview day, you get a really difficult question in that category and you're not prepared for it. For example, lots of people think that they're really good at linked lists because linked lists are a little bit easier, but make sure that you do know how to reverse a linked list. That would be my first mistake. You made a joke about Algo Expert, but I, I do wanted to say that there's a lot of value in actually having a service like Algo Expert um, while preparing. Because the fact of the matter is that if you are able to land this big tech job, for many people, it will be a huge increase in compensation or in salary, right? And so if you're trying to like cobble together free resources and um, you know get, get by through like some half-baked YouTube video, it is actually much better just to put down some money and use a high quality service like Algo Expert because it can translate to a huge impact on your career. So the first mistake I wanna mention is people switching the programming language they use while they prepare. And so a very common example of this is, you know, I have been doing Java programming for three or four years and I know it pretty well, but people tell me that, hey, Python has a much better language. It's gonna be way faster for you to write it and you're gonna perform much better on the interview. And I would say there's maybe some merit to that argument but for the most part, it's a mistake because really the way you should judge what language you should use on an interview is two things. Number one, how quickly can you write the code? Because time is of the essence in the interview. You want to write it quickly. And number two, do you, can you explain that language with some level of depth? And so yeah, Python is definitely a much more concise language compared to Java, which is very verbose. So on number one, Python is kind of, is going to have Java beat. But for number two, if you've been doing Java for years and years, compared to like picking up Python for a month just for the sake of the interview, you probably won't have the same level of depth when you explain why you're doing what you're doing in Python. And a big part of the interview, and I think we'll talk about this a little bit later, is that you need to be able to actually explain your process, your, your thought process and, and why you're doing what you're doing. And, it, and so I would argue that if you know a language really well, just stick with that and make sure you can eloquently defend what you're doing. And that typically doesn't happen if you're just switching from a brand new language. Totally agree. And ultimately, I always say, unless the company is forcing you to write in a specific language, just go with the language that you are most comfortable in, period. And if it does happen to be Java or C++, then you're better at Java and C++ than Python. So agreed. Now, I guess this exactly. brings me to my uh, second mistake, which is um, in an interview, I always advocate that you use the whiteboard that is at your disposal, or if you are, you know, in a remote interview, which most interviews are remote these days, that you use, you know, some sort of scratch pad, whether it be, you know, a Google Doc that you can share your screen with, uh, with your interviewer, or perhaps comments like above your code where you can actually walk through, you know, edge cases and examples, because that really helps you and it helps you know, keep your interviewer in the loop to follow kind of your algorithm log algorithm logic and, and so on and so forth. So since I advocate that you do that in an interview, I also 
advocate that you do that while preparing for interviews. It's a big mistake to prepare for your interviews by always doing everything in your head because yeah, you're in the comfort of your own home and right now you don't need to because you don't have an interviewer. But no, because once you find yourself in that interview room or interview Zoom link, you're not gonna do it if you didn't prepare ahead of time. So all that to say, try to make use of a scratch pad or of you know comments above your code or of a piece of paper while you're preparing for interviews and while you're tackling problems. I think one way to frame it is that you wanna minimize the number of variables between your preparation and your, your actual interview performance. And so, yep. like you said, it's a big mistake to basically say, okay, I'm going to write down the code in isolation on my own and not talk to anyone and then expect to do well in the interview. Because it's going to be a totally different environment where you have someone watching you write code on the whiteboard or on, on, on this coder pad link. And so you have to try and emulate that as much as possible. 100%, that's a really good thing that too many people screw up. Um, and that brings me to my second mistake, which is people not leveraging the recruiter effectively. So I think some people have this misconception that the recruiter at these big tech companies are somehow this antagonistic roadblock trying to prevent you from actually landing the job. But in reality, for the most part, the recruiter wants to help you. They're actually on your team. Because if you actually think about what happens, the recruiter is usually paired up with some hiring manager at the company, right? Some Eng manager who's like trying to fill a position. And the recruiter might even be compensated or be incentivized to try and fill that position quickly with a qualified candidate. And so rather than viewing the recruiter as someone you have to avoid or get past, I would really encourage you to leverage the recruiter and learn from them. Hey, what, what can I do to prepare? What tips do you have for me? And a lot of people ask me like, okay, what do I, what should I do to prepare for this Microsoft or Facebook or whatever interview? And I can tell you that if you're able to hop on the phone with the recruiter, they're going to have way better information than what I could provide or what Clement can provide or what anyone else can provide, right? They're the ones who are actually filling the role. And so rather than viewing them in a negative way, I think a big mistake that people make is uh, not leveraging the recruiter appropriately. Yeah, and for example, a great question that you can ask a recruiter is just confirming with them, am I going to be getting algorithm-style coding interviews? Yeah. For example, maybe you're going to be getting more front-end specific interviews if you're a front-end engineer. Get that confirmation. Uh, should I expect a systems design interview or an API design interview? Right? These are the kinds of questions that I think can be really useful to ask a recruiter. Now, actually, this does really bring me to my third uh, mistake, which is uh, not communicating. Now, obviously, this is a mistake that you can make in the interview, and you know, I'm a huge proponent of communication. I've made you know, N videos about communication, mm -hmm. but I think that the same applies to when you're interview prepping. Again, just like the previous mistake of using a scratch pad, when you're prepping for interviews and you're in the comfort of your own home or at a coffee shop, you might think, okay, here, I'll just do it in my head. You know, I don't need to talk out loud. I don't need to, to go through what I would communicate in an interview. But especially if you're someone who's typically not very comfortable or good at communicating, then you should practice communicating while prepping so that when you go in that interview room, you You've done it before, you know? And yes, that means talking to yourself, or that means maybe not in a coffee shop, but you get the idea. That means doing mock interviews, either with a friend or, you know, with a stranger. We have a service for mock interviews on Algo Expert. There are other ways that you can do mock interviews, but going through that communication exercise during your practice, super, super important. Alex and I, my co-founder, uh, we actually have these mobile apps which talk about the best ways to prepare for interviews. And this is a, a a huge topic that we talk about, which is if you're silent for more than five minutes in the interview, um, that's a big red flag. You have to be able to bring along the interviewer on that journey with you when you're coding. Even if you're stuck, just talk through how are you stuck, how are you approaching it, and you can actually get hints that way. And so um, if you're interested in that kind of content, I'll leave a link for the mobile app in the description. Um, and, and I think that's the perfect segue into the last mistake I'll bring up, which is that interviews are not just measuring your ability to code. There's actually a lot of other things that happen in that full day interview with a company like Facebook or Google. In particular, there's usually an interview about uh, behavior or how do you handle different situations. And so the mistake I see too many people make is they're so focused on just the coding part of the interview, the algorithm interview, they neglect completely this other interview, which is equally important, the culture fit or the behavior interview. And for that, what I can recommend is there's a technique called STAR, situation, task, action, result. And 
uh, what I did when I was preparing for interviews is I literally had a spreadsheet where I wrote down three different narratives, the three different stories in my past working at Pinterest or at Facebook. And I would talk through what was the situation, the task, the action, the result um, for that particular narrative. And no matter what question I got, whether it was like, tell me about a time you dealt with a challenging coworker, tell me about a leadership situation where you led a project, I would navigate the answer into one of the three stories I had written down using that star technique. And I think that number one, it just made me feel very confident that no matter what the question was, I could eloquently navigate it to this uh, story that I could talk about. And number two, I think it did reflect well on me that, okay, this person really has thought through things like leadership or um, dealing with a challenging coworker, all these things that, you know, the coding interview and the other behavior interview is trying to measure in order to hire you. Okay, awesome. So hopefully the six tips that Clement and I shared are things that you can avoid doing as you're preparing for your big tech interview. Hopefully it was helpful. Clement and I also recorded a video about what are the biggest myths that we see about being an ex fang engineer. Clement worked at Facebook and Google, I worked at Facebook and Pinterest. So what are the things that people get wrong about life after you work at one of those companies? So I'll leave a link for that video as well in the description. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.